the first question is, does casein uh, dairy products increase risk of prostate cancer? Also, can plant-based diet reduce risk, especially if my father had prostate cancer? Um, Dr. Roach, would you want to share your answer and uh, also any of the other uh, doctors and experts? Right. So there, you know, there are a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of controversy about how diet affects risk, and actually. The evidence that diet plays a major role in development of prostate cancer is not real strong. Um, we do think that plant-based diets, things that are heart friendly, things that are good for your heart are good for your risk of prostate cancer. Uh, in studies where we've done, where we try to reduce the risk of prostate cancer by giving people vitamin E, selenium, lycopenes, and stuff like that, those studies have all failed to show a reduction in the incidence of prostate cancer. Um, we don't know for sure whether there are dietary things. We do know that some diets are high in carcinogens. These are precursors that tend to cause cancer. For example, when you char meat, if you barbecue some ribs, which I barbecue sometimes, uh, you create carcinogens. Those carcinogens have been known in rat experiments in some cases to cause cancers. But in terms of in people, we really don't have great evidence uh, that uh, diet's important. I believe diet's important, but the evidence is lacking and my colleagues might wanna jump in on this. I agree. I often tell patients in clinic, there's no need for them to go out and buy the prostate health vitamins that are expensive. The same recommendations you get from your primary care doctor in terms of overall health and diet work for prostate cancer as well. I do just caution people on the internet being a source of everything good and bad, that when you have questions about these things, look to the .edu's, the .gov's, places that have at least vetted some of this information to get guidance on what may be helpful, what may not be, or what may be excess and unnecessary. Um, so I always talk about a UCSF website, Prostate Cancer Foundation, so on and so forth, is areas that may have some information that's helpful, but I also tell people there's no need to break the bank or hurt the wallet buying supplements and things like this that have not been clearly shown to be beneficial. The next question. I agree. Thank you. Um, and the next question, uh, what questions should you ask uh, if you have stage four metastatic cancer? Um, I think this, uh, Dr. Roach also answered this in the chat, but I think it's also a great question with Dr. Palmer in regards to how do we communicate with our care team too? So stage four means that the cancer has spread to a distant location. But the problem is that sometimes the evidence that is stage four is, is not very good. So if you do a plain bone scan and the bone scan has a spot that lights up, somebody might always oh, got stage four, but sometimes the bone scan is a false positive. There really isn't disease there. Uh, there's also an important distinction between a metastasis to a lymph node versus a metastasis to the bone. So it depends on why the person is stage four, and it depends on how good the evidence is that a person is stage four. Obviously, if you have a choice, you'd like to be stage one rather than stage four. But there are patients with stage four disease that can live a very long time, and stage four disease can be treatable. So there's a lot, there are a lot more details that we would need to give to be specific about the management of a patient with stage four disease. But the first thing is we're not always accurate when we say a person does or even doesn't have stage four disease, but the treatments are getting better for stage four disease. Uh, and I'll just add that, you know, you can always ask about how long they anticipate you being on certain medications like hormone therapy to uh, keep the cancer at bay. Um, and if there are other treatments that they can consider, as Dr. Roach mentioned, there's lots of advancements and lots of new medications that keep coming out. And so that's always a discussion uh, or a great question to ask your doctor about other medications that could help. And I would just add, it's a good opportunity to make sure that you have the records or like you, they tell you what scan they did. They tell you what tests were done, but you potentially have printouts of the reports. So then you're able to bring that to another provider if you're getting a second opinion, if you're talking to someone else. So they have that information there, but also so you can reference it. You can look up things that may or may not make sense in it if you so choose. Right. Thank you. 
Um, and in line uh, uh, with that, uh, those answers, uh, one of the questions is uh, following hormone therapy, what are the long-term possible treatments? So I also put an answer in on, on that one. So I'll, I'll jump right in. So it turns out that in some patients when we're using radiation with hormone therapy, we only use hormone therapy for as short as four months and then it's done. And then there may not be any additional treatments that are needed. At the other end of the spectrum are people that have stage four disease with progression who end up on hormone therapy for the rest of their lives. So we have, we have some people that are scheduled to have short-term temporary hormone therapy that does not require anything to be done after that. And at the other extreme, people that are on it for the rest of their lives. So without knowing where this person is in the spectrum, uh, it's really hard to comment. When, when hormone therapy stops working, well, first of all, there's different categories of hormone therapy, different intensities of hormone therapy. So some Sometimes when the standard hormone therapy, Lupron or something like that stops working, sometimes we can use more modern agents that will still work. So once you've failed on one type of hormone therapy, it does not mean that you won't respond to another type of hormone therapy. So, so there's the range of short-term, long-term, people that are still sensitive to hormone therapy and people that have disease which is resistant to hormone therapy that makes that a more complicated a question to answer. Thank you. And uh, here's the uh, last question before we uh, move on. And again, uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll be able to uh, answer them. Uh, is genetic testing something that is common, uh, is a common step for those who've been diagnosed with prostate cancer? So I think there's genetic testing or genomic testing that we do on the biopsy tissue, for example. That can depend largely on where you get your care, if it's available, insurance coverage, so on and so forth. Gen genetic testing, because you have a strong family history, so, or you have multiple family members who have prostate cancer or breast cancer, those are parts that are actually worked into our guidelines. We know across the board that's not happening as often as it should. So these are also things that should be questions. Is there a need for me to do genetic counseling because of my family history? Or is there genetic testing that could be done on my tissue from the biopsy you've already taken? Excellent questions to have and discussion to have with the providers, but it largely depends on a lot of different factors outside of your family history and the cancer characteristics. So, so let me just add one point there. So there's so just to clarify what, uh, what Dr. Washington's talking about. There's testing on the tumor to look for mutations in the tumor that might point toward what specific drugs might be useful in that individual patient. Then there's genetic testing on the patient that looks at the genetics of the patient. Do, is my family predisposed to developing prostate cancer? So we call that germline testing versus somatic testing. And then it depends on also how you present. So prostate cancer is very common and most people present with common types of prostate cancer, but occasionally you'll get a patient that has very advanced prostate cancer. They'll be 50 years old and they'll walk in with, with metastatic disease, very aggressive disease. When you see a patient like that, you're much more likely to want to order somatic testing on that tumor because of the unusual presentation suggest they might have a mutation in the tumor. But for the typical common low risk early prostate cancer, we usually don't do somatic testing and we don't do germline testing for most of those patients because the, the, it's the most common cancer in men. The median age of onset is 66. So if you see an 80 year old guy walk in with a little bit of prostate cancer, we don't worry about germline testing because it's not atypical. We don't worry about somatic testing because we don't think he's got a particularly aggressive form of prostate cancer. So it really depends on those sorts of details. If I might add, Dr. Roach, um, it, you know, sometimes, you know, and it all depends on the situation and scenario, but sometimes with a patient, when you're negotiating active surveillance versus an intervention, sometimes we do do genetic testing on the biopsy 
to sort of test and see if a Gleason 3 plus 3 or something that's otherwise considered as low risk may actually be reclassified as high risk so that we can then educate the patient to say, hey, this possibly could be intermediate to high risk. Right. Maybe that should push you over the edge in getting tested or getting, sur I'm sorry, getting surgery or getting a treatment. That is absolutely true. But most of the time when I do it in that setting, I'm doing to reassure the patient because most of the data, long-term data on active surveillance is based on patients that did not have that genetic testing done. But sometimes I have a patient who I don't want to treat. I want the patient to do active surveillance and the patient's afraid to do active surveillance. I will do genetic testing on the tissue only because I want to be able to say, see, Mr. Jones, your genetic test confirmed that you have low risk disease. You really don't need to worry. I'm not doing it because I think that maybe, I mean, the probability that he has aggressive disease despite appearing to have low risk disease is very small in that setting, but sometimes the patient needs reassurance. May, may I ask a question? Uh, may to bring it down to maybe another level. Uh, you, you can hear from the discussion. There's all these conversations around both the, the diagnosis and management. How does an individual select? I guess your first encounter is always with your primary care doctor. But I can guarantee you many primary care doctors are not as knowledgeable uh, as the, the, the group of experts we have here today. How does someone who has the diagnosis of prostate cancer select a urologist? What questions should they ask uh, before they choose uh, to go with one system or another? Because all these choices, all these choices is exactly what, um, what we've been talking about, sometimes hard to make. So what questions should I ask when I choose a urologist uh, to be comfortable that he can collate all of this stuff and get me to the right place? I'll let the urologist <laughs> answer that question. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, I think, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I think that you would change the perspective and ask yourself, what do you want? You know, and then from there, you want to have good health. You want to know what kind of disease you have. And maybe you want to have someone who can communicate to, the, to that, that to you in an effective way. So from there, that's sort of the interview or the first thing when you talk to a urologist, you get a referral, that's the things I'm thinking about. Is this guy communicating to me clearly? Um, and really the first thing, and I mentioned this in the talk is, do you feel that he cares about you? Yeah, you let me push back on that. Uh, what about how confident is he? What about his outcomes? What about his experience with other, uh, with other, with other patients? Are, are those not important questions to ask? I'll jump in there. I think they're incredibly important. And I think particularly when you start talking about treatment options, you need to know, I mean, you need to ask the surgeon, for example, what are their outcomes? Not everyone tracks those. Um, so it's good to ask to understand how well they are monitoring their own outcomes after surgery, for example, right? It's important to know how other patients have perceived care from this person. So you'll come across people that have had the same urologist for care, or you'll see reviews as reliable or not, as they may be, is one way to look at it. Look at their prior history, their training, so on and so forth. Or things that in my clinical practice, I mean, in my clinic yesterday, people were like, I looked at your bio, I had these questions based on your biography. So I know that patients are looking at this and it doesn't mean that there will be a connection there, but it gives, that's their way of understanding where I'm coming from. Um, and there are certainly questions that you should ask up front uh, about the provider's um, predisposition to one thing or another, as well as their outcomes. There are so many choices along the line that you have to make, and I'm going to dominate the conversation, but you have to trust. Uh, Dr. Lankford was my doctor when I had to make decisions. I made decisions based upon the fact I looked him up. I saw what his credentials were. I talked to his other patients. I interacted with him initially. I asked him questions and I trusted his judgment. And I think those are the things that you want to come out with uh, before, because there's a lot of, I ended up uh, listening to the temptations under the cyber night, but it was a lot of choices before I got to that point. And so I think tr competency, trust, uh, I think oh, those are all critical issues that people should check with. 
Sometimes uh, you get a, your, a primary care doctor refer you to his brother, who's a urologist, but you need to check a lot of other things like Dr. Palmer said. Many I might people. also add, it shows the importance to the attendees of bringing someone with you to right. your appointment. You, it, it, yes, you want to do everything by yourself, but no, for the best outcome, you need to have someone there with you. How do you feel about the importance about talking to other black men about prostate cancer and about their health in your day to day? So outside of uh, the medical environment. I just say one thing. I used to start all my talks with uh, one of the reasons why I got interested in healthcare, in particular, because I, I use a lot. I loved acting and I loved poetry and stuff like that. I was a, a theater geek, and so um, I should have stayed with that because maybe I. Well, that's another discussion. But, <laughs> but um, one of the ways that I uh, talked about healthcare and kind of sparked my interest was. I, I used to go to a barber shop on Sacramento Avenue. It was called Johnson's Barber Shop. If anybody's from Oakland, California, Berkeley, they know about this shop. And uh, there was a woman who cut my hair and she was the best barber um, that I've ever had in my life. Her name was Mrs. Johnson and she actually passed away due to colon cancer. Um, and so I used to always start my talk off with uh, showing a picture of her. But during those times when I was in the barber shop and if anybody has ever gone to a black barber shop, you know that, you know what I'm saying? You may, you, especially if you're young, you may wait there for four or five hours to get your hair cut. I mean, at least that's how it was when I was growing up. And everyone would talk about their health concerns and issues at the barbershop. Hey, you know, I got the prostate. I don't know this and that. And so that was kind of what got my wheels turning about. And, and as we know, all the urologists, Dr. Washington could tell you, Dr. Roach could tell you that there has been a lot of data, especially with prostate cancer and these barbershop prostate cancer uh, sort of surveys. Um, and that's an, an area where they get a lot of data about prostate cancer and, and generate a lot of um, discussion. So I think that it's very important to talk to other um, black males about health, uh, specifically, you know, the ones that kill us at a higher rate, um, like prostate cancer. But, uh, and so, you know, and the barbershop's a great place to do it. I would just agree with, oh, sorry to interrupt. No, no, please, yeah. I was just gonna say, I agree with that. I think we often focus on the disease and then extrapolate outward. But the same problems and issues that we have with getting treatment for prostate cancer are the same ones we see for blood pressure, for cholesterol, for kidney disease. Prostate cancer is just a subset of that, right? So I feel like talking to other people about all of these problems is a great way to understand what's going on big picture. And then you focus on, okay, for the prostate cancer, what are other people experiencing? What are their problems? For the blood pressure, same thing. But I think, you know, on the clinical side, us being super nerdy, I think we hone in too much on the disease and forget everything else that's going on. I like to flip that the other way. Dr. Palmer, would you like to comment on that? This is kind of your area. Uh, I just say, speak to as many people as possible. Don't be afraid to have the conversation. The bottom line is trying to deal with it on your own is not the best idea. Um, one of my esteemed uh, alcohol colleague and friend here, uh, one of his favorite, one of my favorite quotes of his is, my thoughts aren't facts. And so if you stay in your head about what's happening with your own experience, that can be very problematic. But if you talk to your doctors, your family, your friends, um, and hear about other people's experience, that usually helps. Everyone I've spoken to always says it helps through their process. Um, and I think it's important to listen to that. 